time the heavy fighting got started in Sicily, the Germans were running hard, real hard, but they did try to hold us back. They used every trick in the book, and they hurt us, but we hurt them more. In 1943, Gus Maisel was already a veteran of the North African campaign when he landed in Sicily with the U.S. Army's 1st Division. He is a former New Yorker who now lives in Sherman Oaks, California, and is employed as an electronics technician. Fred James Steck was a German paratrooper who fought against the Allied invasion of Sicily. Today he is a United States citizen, completing graduate studies in linguistics at the University of Southern California. I was home on furlough, celebrating my 22nd birthday and somehow trying to forget the terrible fighting I had been through in Russia. Then, overnight, I found myself back in battle again, fighting for my life on the island of Sicily. In the same week in 1941, Fred James Steck and Gus Maisel entered military service. A little over two years later, they were locked in combat on the stormy island of Sicily. Two fighting men, one German, one American, relived that moment in history. I'm Jim Bishop. By early 1943, the clamor for a second front has mounted steadily, not only from the Russians, but from many other allied quarters. If Italy could be knocked out of the war, it would do much to weaken the Axis grip on Europe. The target of the strategy is Sicily. May 13, 1943. General Sir Harold Alexander flashes a triumphant message to his prime minister. Sir, it is my duty to report that the Tunisian campaign is over. We are masters of the North African shore. On that same day, the combined chiefs of staff accept General Dwight Eisenhower's final plan for the invasion of Sicily, Operation Husky. Invasion day is set for July 10th, during the period of a favorable moon. From the huge buildup of ships and troops in North Africa, the Germans and Italians are forced into a furious guessing game as to the Allies' next move. They know the next attack will come across the Mediterranean to hit the European continent. But where? British naval intelligence tries to shape Axis thinking by planting the dead body of a fictitious Major William Martin on the coast of Spain. It carries false documents designed to lead the Germans and Italians to believe that the Peloponnesus and Sardinia are the intended targets. The cleverly devised ruse fools no one except Adolf Hitler. He orders troops and material diverted to Greece. On July 9, 1943, a huge amphibious assault force is on its way from six North African ports. Aboard one of the troop carriers is a machine gunner in the 16th Infantry Regiment, 1st Division, Private Gus Maisel. Looking at the guys around me, I have come to certain conclusions about the average GI. He's a griper, and he growls. The more he gripes, the tougher he gets. The more he growls, the madder he gets. And all this makes him want to get it all over with as soon as he can. You boys are always Sally's favorites. But I'm not happy with you this morning. You're up to something. Last night you sneaked away from Africa. The American 1st Division embarked from five points. But already one of its regiments is lost. Seems a torpedo hit their ship. This makes me quite sad. I hope no harm comes to the rest of you. That would be terrible. 
wouldn't it, George? George, speak to the boys. Easy there, Yank. There's danger ahead. Here we've been on the way less than 24 hours, and the Germans already know it. Every bit is true, except the part about having sunk us. But that could happen too. We laugh about it, even though it makes you sort of uneasy to know the enemy is watching every move you make. Suddenly, the fair weather and calm seas desert the Allies. Winds of almost gale proportions make the high command consider postponing the assault and returning to port. But in the end, General Eisenhower and Admiral Cunningham decide to ride out the storm and keep going. Everybody on board is sicker than a dog. The Mediterranean is throwing up waves that look 40 feet high. No wonder they call this sea the wicked old witch. As usual, there are plenty of rumors making the rounds. Some guys are guessing it's Corsica, and others think it's going to be southern France. But I'm not putting my money on any place yet. With this kind of sea and all the seasick GIs, the brass might just decide to turn around and head right back to port. By evening, the gamble against the stormy seas pays off. The coast of Sicily is dead ahead. Admiral Hewitt, commander of the Western Naval Task Force, wants to open a pre-invasion barrage. But the Army opposes naval gunfire as an aid to a landing. The Axis enemy is far from taken by surprise. An Italian plane has spotted the convoys. By 1 a.m. on the 10th, General Alfredo Gazzoni, commander of Axis forces on Sicily, has ordered all troops at ready alert. The brass have finally let us in on their secret, the island of Sicily. Our outfit is going in on a beach near Jela. We know the British and Canadians are going to hit the eastern end of the island. The general feeling is, oh, those guys don't know how to fight, and no doubt they think the same about us. As far as I'm concerned, my company, H Company, is the best company in the best regiment, in the whole army. In fact, in the whole world. of the assault, transport planes carry over 3,000 paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne Division. But high winds and a shortage of experience among the transport pilots scatter paratroopers along a 60-mile line. As prearranged, eight reinforced divisions land abreast over a front of almost 100 miles of coastline. The American landing parties key in on three small coastal towns in the western sector, Licata, Gala, and Scorici. so hot on Red Beach that the Beachmaster requests all landings be held up. The Navy guns finally get their chance.
under a smoke screen, all remaining LCTs reached the beach by 8 a.m. sudden I get the feeling that in this here place I'm going to get it and get it good. Thirty minutes after we hit the beach we run into the enemy. With my buddy J.C. Reesonover I set my machine gun on a position on high ground looking right down the enemy's throat and we're doing the Germans a lot of damage. Germans fly reinforcements to the embattled island, among them the highly disciplined troops of the 1st Parachute Division. One of these men is Private Second Class Fred James Steck. Ever since Marshal Rommel's retreat from Africa, this invasion across the Mediterranean by the Allies was expected. How strong the enemy forces are, we are not told. But it doesn't require an SOS to know that reinforcements are needed immediately. The Italians have betrayed our landing. Before we can get away from the trap zone, enemy Spitfires are on top of us. took a heavy toll. We regroup and board trucks that will take us to Syracuse. General Guzzoni sets his counterattack in motion. The Italian general sends his armor and infantry across the Gala Plain toward the beach, fully confident of destroying the Gala beachhead by nightfall. The Allied invasion of Sicily is only hours old. The landings have run into stiff opposition as heavy armor counterattacks in strength. American infantry puts in a desperate call for more supporting fire from the Navy. With the first column of Panzers just three miles from the beach, the cruiser Boise opens with fire that halts the enemy armor in its tracks. out for Germans when a girl turns up and tells us something about Tedeschi and Bicicletas. We think she's making a play for us. What she really means is she saw Germans around here on bicycles. Americans are moving forward, the Eastern Task Force under the command of General Montgomery is facing stiffer air attack than the Americans.
threat of new attacks by the enemy has brought us to positions outside Syracuse. The city is supposedly defended by Italian heavy artillery, but all we can see are British tanks and troops. The Italians have surrendered. Before we can decide the next move, we see enemy soldiers approaching. They have no idea at all that we are waiting for them. of July 12th finds the enemy retiring to the east. It now becomes apparent to the Axis that Sicily will fall. Their plans from that moment on change from island defense to a holding action that will allow the three German divisions to escape to the Italian mainland. To counter this move, General Alexander revises the battle plan. General Patton's 7th Army will clear out the western half of the island, leaving the British forces free to cut off Messina the only possible evacuation point for the enemy troops. The 3rd Division covers 100 miles from Agrigento to Palermo in four days. It falls to the Americans on July 22nd. fighting, people come out and talk with us. We don't understand much, but we give them candy, some cigarettes, and soap. They're a beaten nation, a beaten people, looking for something better to live for. bullet caught J.C. right in the head. He's had it. He's got no more troubles. But I have, because the Germans are overrunning my position. When it's all over, I find myself next to five dead Germans with a bayonet in my stomach. Next thing I know, the medics arrive. From the looks of things, the war is over for me. I have no regrets. It's something that has made real men out of a lot of people and made darn fools out of others. Losses have been so heavy that whole companies have ceased to exist. After three days of battle, virtually all ammunition, food and water are gone. The order is given to retreat. But in truth, it is a confused escape. What is left of my company is retreating north to the sea. The fighting now is completely without orientation. There is no real front line. We do not know if Palermo and Messina are still in our hands. All we can do is keep moving north.
The Sicilian people, for the most part, are indifferent toward us. They are more concerned that their crops, their trees and other possessions are not destroyed in the fighting. But there are others who are joining the Americans and the British. They have it in for us, attacking even our wounded. As we enter Messina, we find that the streets are heavily guarded. The Navy has taken charge of the evacuation and there is a constant running of landing barges and small Navy ships between Messina and Italy. My condition is growing worse from the malaria I have contracted. It will be ironic if after surviving in battle I should die on a hospital cot. By August 17th, over 60,000 men and 15,000 vehicles are off Sicily and onto the Italian mainland. On that day, forward elements of General Patton's 7th Army move into Messina and find it deserted. Gus Maisel receives the Silver Star Medal for his courage during the fighting in Sicily. After recovering from his wound, he is returned to the United States and given honorable discharge on December 7, 1944. Paratrooper Steck fights again in Italy until captured by partisans. He manages to escape and in turn is captured by the British. In September 1945, he returns to his native home in Frankfurt, Germany. In invading Sicily, the Allies believed they were striking at the soft underbelly of Europe. That here was the spot for the next hard blow against the Axis. In part, they were correct. Italy was forced to abandon the war. But the fighting itself was an unexpected prelude of the bloody campaign yet to come in the long drive up the Italian boot. The cow was frozen hard. So in the night, we buried our dead by covering them with new fallen snow. Then again, we took up our positions. By now, we knew it was impossible to escape from Stalingrad. In the Russian campaign of 1942-43, Johann Yakubiak was a private in the German 6th Army driving on Stalingrad. Today, he is a waiter living and working in Las Vegas, Nevada. For reasons of his own, this man prefers to be identified only as Corporal Ivan. As a soldier in the Red Army, he too fought at Stalingrad. Today he works as a steam presser and lives in the United States. Before joining the Red Army, never had I been further than 10 kilometers from my home. Now it was gone. But at Stalingrad, we made the enemy pay for everything he had done to us. In the frozen hell of Stalingrad, the lives of Johann Yakubiak and Corporal Ivan came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one German, one Russian, relive that moment in history. June 28, 1942. For a year, the German invader has been in Russia. But Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's war to exterminate what he calls the Slavic Horde, has not gone according to plan. Both Moscow and Leningrad have withstood the German onslaught. 
Now, in the summer of 1942, Hitler takes personal command of the army, orders it to wheel south, drive for Stalingrad on the Volga. Assigned the capture of Stalingrad is the powerful German 6th Army, under General Friedrich von Paulus, its troops proud victors of the Blitzkrieg through Holland, Belgium, and France. One of the 6th Army soldiers is Corporal Johann Jakubiak. I am an artillery observer attached to the 176th Infantry Divisions. We have been fighting in Ukraine and Russia for more than one year. Most of us did not expect the Russians to fight back so long. But now with the roads and fields dry again, our army has opened a giant offensive against the enemy. This time we will finish them off. If the advancing German army can capture Stalingrad, their prize will be an industrial city of 700,000 people. A city dominating the Volga River, the jugular vein in the throat of the Soviet Union. He who holds Stalingrad seals Russia off from the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. It's a big assignment, and it must be done before the snow falls. The significance of Stalingrad is appreciated by Stalin, too. And the crack 62nd Siberian Army under General Vasily Chuikov is ordered into battle. As Hitler's armies drive toward the Don River, their tactics are no secret to the Russians. A few days before the German offensive opened, the entire plan fell into Russian hands. Too late to make changes, the drive moves ahead as scheduled. And even though the Russians know the place, the time, and the objectives, the German army is too powerful to be stopped. First, the campaign moves fast. The weather is warm and the German panzers move swiftly across the open Russian steppes. Rostov to the south falls on July 27th. The 6th Army has reached the Don River and this last natural obstacle barring the way to Stalingrad slows the Blitzkrieg. Stalingrad and the Volga are only 40 miles away, but stubborn Russian opposition becomes more tenacious with each mile. Mile after mile, just one cannon after another. Heavy guns on light guns, German guns, Romanian on Italian. Whenever we encounter enemy strong points, they are immediately destroyed with a thunder shower of fire. August 21st, the 6th Army, now supported by a fresh Panzer Division, makes its big push to cross the Don. Early in the morning, more than 100 assault boats begin crossing the river. Within hours, six infantry regiments have established a beachhead on the east bank. In the less than two-month-old campaign, the Russian army has lost a quarter of a million men. As the Germans pushed toward the Volga, the Reds braced themselves to lose even more. Day and night, we keep pushing across the steps. Fighting is very heavy. I direct our battery to give supporting fire to the infantry. The Russians bring more troops to drive us back towards the Don. But our guns and panzers are cutting them to pieces. Into the 40-mile margin separating the Don from the Volga, the Russians have jammed every available fighting man. Stalingrad itself, with the Volga at its back, is turned into an armed camp. Everyone who can hold a shovel is told to dig. Trenches, foxholes, tank traps. Any thought of evacuation is canceled by Stalin's direct order. Soldiers will fight harder, he says, for a live city than for an empty one. One of the Russian soldiers ordered to the Stalingrad front is a twice wounded veteran from a small town near Minsk, Corporal Ivan. I just returned this week from the hospital to my company outside Pugachev. Now they order us to the Stalingrad sector. Everyone knows the situation there is critical, but the reports are confusing. All we can be sure of is that there is more war ahead for us. The Germans must be stopped or everything is lost. August 
August 26th, the Luftwaffe launches the most devastating bombing attack of the campaign against Stalingrad. While Stalingrad reels under the Luftwaffe, the German troops move steadily closer to the shattered city. By September, the city is cut off from three sides, but still the Russians hang on. The Stalingrad tractor plant continues to work, and during September alone, under constant bombardment, turns out 350 tanks and armored cars. More than half are destroyed in a desperate attempt to throw the Germans back. guns are in the perimeter of Stalingrad, supporting the Dresden division. From my position, I can see in the distance six high grain elevators, still in Russian hands. If there is that much wheat in the city, the Russian could hold out in a siege. Two months after the opening of the German offensive, the city limits are finally penetrated. During the first week of September, German troops break into the city in a dozen places. The rail line to Moscow is cut. Now Stalingrad's only supply route is from across the Volga, behind the city. By the middle of September, the Germans have taken the highest point in town. Ironically, it is a Russian cemetery known as the Mamai Kurgan. From this high point, artillery and stupas can be zeroed in on the Russians. After the Germans take the Mamai Kurgan on September 16th, the Red Army's 13th Guards Rifles charges the strong point. Seven thousand Russian soldiers die in the battle for the high ground. But by the end of the day, the Germans have given it up. They are back down the hill. My company has been held in reserve near Saratov. The news that our Soviet soldiers controlled the high ground in Stalingrad gives us encouragement. All of us want to go there and join the fight, but the order is to wait. The battle for Stalingrad moves not just from block to block, but from house to house. The front line is very often the room next door. I watch for enemy movements within the city so that I can direct artillery fire against them. To keep the Russians from spotting my positions, I keep well on the cola. General artillery observers are the most dangerous for them. If they spot you, they do everything to destroy you. We are fighting for every house and cellar. Our weapons are superior to theirs, but they never seem to run out of men. November 9th, special German street fighting experts are brought in to finish the battle. As they move against the stubborn wall of Russian resistance, Hitler tells the world, except for a few small places, Stalingrad is in our hands.
German soldiers begin calling the battle for Stalingrad a rotten krieg, a rat's war, as every pile of rubble becomes a point to take or defend. As the rat's war continues in the streets, Hitler ignores reports that General Georgi Zhukov is massing an enormous force north of the city for a crushing counterattack. November 16th, the oldest and best of Russia's allies arrives on the scene. The first snow of winter covers the field. This morning, we arrived at Leninsk. Stalingrad is directly across the river. From the shelling and bombs falling on Stalingrad, we are as nervous as those in the struggle. Thousands of soldiers are gathering here. Also, there are many, many wounded here that only the severe cases are evacuated. The others will go back with us to Stalingrad. The Volga is a frozen bridge. Our company is crossing over to Stalingrad on foot. 25,000 other troops will be with us. My comrades and I have no specific orders, only speeches from our leaders. They tell us that as the Soviet soldiers, we must stop the fascist enemy. If necessary, with a wall of bodies as high as the Caucasus. November 19th, the Russians are ready to strike. As the guns come up and tanks are made ready to roll, the attack order goes out. The invader must now fight for his life. November 19, 1942, Russian artillery opens a gigantic enveloping maneuver. One army north of the Germans, one to the south. A half million Russian soldiers, 1,500 tanks sweep in to crush the overextended German lines in a bear hug. From east of the frozen Volga, the Russians begin to move tanks, trucks, supplies, and men. From across the steppes sweeps a band of 50,000 saber-swinging Cossacks. Under the onslaught, the German line begins to bend. Then, through an area held by two Romanian divisions, the Russians make a breach. Quickly widening it to two miles, the Red Army races through the gap. Almost overnight, the Germans find themselves being crowded into a pocket. Three days after their big strike, Red Army troops swinging between the Volga and the Don link up with their comrades coming around the other side. At a point near the Don, 40 miles west of Stalingrad, the Russian pincers snap shut. Trapped inside, more than 225,000 men of the German 6th Army. From von Powell's, a message goes to Berlin. Army encircled. Whole of Stalingrad now in Russian hands. Strong enemy forces approaching from the southeast and in great strength from northwest. Ammunition situation acute. Situation could compel abandonment of Stalingrad. As the squeeze tightens, von Paulus requests permission to attempt a breakout. Food, fuel, ammunition, all are in short supply. Hitler considers a breakout, then with Goering's assurance that the army can be supplied by air, orders it to dig in. Stay and fight, he says. I am not leaving the Volga. He announces that henceforth the army will be known as Fortress Stalingrad. The Russians, more realistically, refer to it as an armed camp of prisoners. We have our outpost in a cellar occupied by some Russian civilians with children. They stare at us, but we are more concerned with the enemy outside. The Russians are suddenly appearing from everywhere. Two of our cannon have been destroyed since this morning. But this makes small difference. Ammunition is so low that I can direct fire only on targets of utmost importance. The German soldier immediately begins to feel a shortage of ammunition. Rounds are counted now and rationed. 
A thrift is imposed at a time when only extravagance can win the battle. December 2nd, the Russians launch another full-scale attack on a trapped army. The rocket-launching Katusha pours fire into a steadily shrinking target. For us, the situation is very critical. Reinforcements and supplies have been promised, but they do not arrive. We have ammunition only for small arms. Medical supplies are gone. Bandages are taken from the wounded who die, then sterilized in water melted from the snow. So many Soviet soldiers have come to Stalingrad in the past two days that in our sector there are two and three men in every hole. Everyone talks about the great encirclement of the Germans by our army. In this trapped situation, they will fight very hard against us until we crush them. The enemy is in the ruins not more than 50 meters from us. My comrades say there is Italian troops with the Germans, but they tremble more from fear than the cold. We make some jokes about them. Then someone says, kill all the Germans first, then the Italians, and the Romanians, you can leave it to me. I tell myself, I will shoot at whatever comes first. From the south, a German panzer army battles its way towards Stalingrad to relieve the encircled sixth. After four weeks, with hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers between the two German forces, the rescue attempt dies, 32 miles from the trapped 6th Army. Urged to break through the Russian circle and fight his way toward the relief army, von Paulus refuses without Hitler's approval. Hitler says the 6th Army will stay where it is. We have not eaten in three days. I am out looking for food when I find a frozen horse. An officer asked me, soldier, will you give me some of that meat? I say, no, no, I risk my life for it. Go get your own. How low the morale and discipline of our army have sunk. Gehring's boastful promise to keep Stalingrad supplied by air is lost in blizzards of snow. 278 planes are lost in December alone. Some pilots refuse to land in the pocket. They throw supplies from the sky. Von Paulus Radio's Army Headquarters, if the Fuhrer's order to deliver 300 tons daily is not carried out, we are headed for a catastrophe. The Army is starving and freezing. It has nothing to eat or shoot and can no longer move its vehicles. January 8th, a Russian truce team demands the German surrender. Hitler provides the Army's answer. Surrender is forbidden. The 6th Army will hold its positions until the last man and the last round of ammunition. On January 27th, Russian troops drive right through the center of the Stalingrad pocket, splitting it in two. At five-minute intervals, the Russian radio broadcasts, every seven seconds, a German soldier dies in Stalingrad. Our company is closing on the enemy. Bullets whistle from everywhere. I fall. Then quick I get up and run forward. I collapse. A bullet has smashed through my mouth. As I try to call for help, the snow under me turns black. January 30th. Hitler promotes von Paulus to the rank of field marshal and with devastating logic remarks that in all German history no field marshal has ever been taken prisoner. This then is Hitler's solution to his fiasco at Stalingrad. One day after his promotion, field marshal von Paulus surrenders Fortress Stalingrad. And as all scattered pockets of German resistance surrender, the last German radio message to leave Stalingrad is sent from a weather station. 
Temperature minus 13 degrees centigrade. Over Stalingrad, fog and red haze. Meteorological station now closing down. Greetings to the homeland. Half of our group is wiped out. The rest of us surrender. Then this Russian lieutenant says to me, Tovarish, Tovarish, the war is over for you. I reply, it is good there is no more. For me, there is no relief, no sadness. After all the hardships, I am empty of feelings. I look at the Russians surrounding us. When we are fighting them, we were not looking at them as anything human. They were just the enemy, but they have suffered more than us. Now that is over, I begin to see how terrible this whole war has been. After Johann Yakubiak's capture at Stalingrad, he is sent to a prison camp at Tashkent in southeastern Russia. Of the 130,000 German soldiers who marched into captivity at Stalingrad, he is one of the 5,000 who will live to return to the West. Corporal Ivan, wounded at Stalingrad, fights in Poland after his recovery. Later fights in Germany, where he is again wounded at the Oder River. By Hitler's own blunder, the army he had once boasted could storm the heavens had gone to its death in the city of Stalin. For the German people, Stalingrad shattered all illusions of an invincible Wehrmacht. For the Allies, it marked the turning point of the war. The city has another name now, Volgograd, but the battle on the Volga will always be called Stalingrad.